Part five of Child Christopher and Goldilin the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seventeen Goldilin comes back to Green Harbour. They rode speedily and had with them men who knew the woodland ways, so that the journey was not so long thence as Goldilind had made it thither. And they stayed not for nightfall, since the moon was bright, so that they came before the castle gates before midnight. Now Goldilind looked to be cast into prison, whatever might befall her upon the morrow. But so it went not, for she was led straight to her own chamber, and one of her women, but not Aloise, waited on her, and when she tried to have some tidings of her, the woman spake to her no more than if she were dumb. So all unhappily she laid her down in her bed, foreboding the worst, which she deemed might well be death at the hand of her jailers. As for Christopher, she saw the last of him as they entered the castle gate, and knew not what they had done with him. So she lay in dismal thoughts, but at last fell asleep for mere weariness. When she awoke it was broad day, and there was someone going about in the chamber. She turned and saw that it was Aloise. She felt sick at heart, and durst not move or ask of tidings, but presently Aloise turned and came to the bed, and made an obeisance, but spake not. Goldilind raised her head and said wearily, What is to be done, Aloise? Wilt thou tell me? for my heart fails me, and me seems, unless they have some mercy, I shall die to-day. Nay, said the chambermaid, keep thine heart up, for here is one at hand who would see thee, when it is thy pleasure to be seen. Yea, said Goldilind, dame Eleanor to wit, and she moaned, and fear and heart-sickness lay so heavy on her, that she went nigh to swooning. But Aloise lifted up her head, and brought her wine, and made her drink, and when Goldilind was come to herself again, the maid said, I say, keep up thine heart, for it is not Dame Eleanor and the rods that would see thee, but a mighty man, nay, the most mighty to wit, Earl Geoffrey, who is king of Medum in all but the name. Goldilind did in sooth take heart at this tidings, and she said, I wonder what he may have to do here. All this while he hath not been to Green Harbour, or may happen it might have been better for me. I wot not, said Aloise, but even so it is. I shall tell thee, the messenger, whose horse thou didst steal, brought no other word in his mouth save this, that my lord earl was coming, and come he did. But that was toward sunset, long after they had laid the bloodhounds on thy slot, and I had been whipped for letting thee find the way out of gates. Now, our lady, when thou hast seen the earl, and hast become our lady and mistress indeed, Wilt thou bethink thee of the morn before yesterday on my behalf? Yea, said Goldilind, if ever it shall befall. Befall it shall, said Aloise. I dreamed of thee three nights ago, and thou sitting on thy throne commanding and forbidding the great men. But at worst no harm hath happened save to my shoulders and sides by thy stealing thyself, since thou hast come back in the nick of time, and of thine own will, as men say. But tell me now of thine holiday, and if it were pleasant to thee. Goldilind fell a-weeping at the word, bethinking her of yesterday morning, and Aloise stood looking on her, but saying naught. At last spake Goldilind softly, Tell me, Aloise, didst thou hear any speaking of that young man who was brought in hither last night? Have they slain him? said Aloise. Soothly, my lady, I deem they have done him no hurt, though I wot not for sure. There hath been none headed or hanged in the base court to-day. I heard talk amongst the men of arms of one whom they took. They said he was a wonder of sheer strength, and how that he cast their men about as though he were playing at ball. Sooth to say, they seem to bear him no grudge therefore. But now I would counsel thee to arise, and I am bidden to tire and array thee at the best. And now I would say a word in thine ear, to wit, that Dame Eleanor feareth thee somewhat this morn. So Goldilind arose, and was arrayed like a very queen, and was served of what she would by Aloise and the other women, and sat in her chamber, awaiting the coming of the mighty Lord of Medum. Chapter 18 Earl Geoffrey Speaks with Goldilind 
but a little while had she sat there before footsteps a many came to the door which was thrown open and straight it was as if the sun had shone on a flower bed for there was come earl geoffrey and his lords all arrayed most gloriously then came the earl up the chamber to goldilind and bent the knee before her and said lady and queen is it thy pleasure that thy servant should kiss thine hand she made him little cheer but reached out to him her lily hand in its gold sleeve and said thou must do thy will so he kissed the hand reverently and said and these my lords may they enter and do obeisance and kiss hands my lady said goldilind i will not strive to gainsay their will or thine my lord so they entered and knelt before her and kissed her hand and to say sooth most of them had been fain to kiss both hands of her yea and her cheeks and her lips though but little cheer she made them but looked sternly on them then the earl spake to her and told her of her realm and how folk thrived and of the deep peace that was upon the land and of the merry days of medum and the praise of the people and she answered him nothing but as he spake her bosom began to heave and the tears came into her eyes and rolled down her cheeks then man looked on man and the earl said my masters i deem that my lady hath will to speak to me privily as to one who is her chiefest friend and well-willer is it so my lady she might not speak for the tears that welled out from her heart but she bowed her head and strove to smile on him but the earl waved his hand and those lords and the women also voided the chamber and left those two alone the earl standing before her but ere he could speak she arose from her throne and fell on her knees before him and joined hands palm to palm and cried in a broken voice mercy mercy have pity on my young life great lord but he lifted her up and set her on her throne again and said nay my lady this is unmeet but if thou wouldst talk and tell with me i am ready to hearken she strove with her passion a while and then she said great lord i pray thee to hearken and to have patience with a woman's weak heart prithee sit down here beside me it were unfitting he said i shall take a lowlier seat then he drew a stool to him and sat down before her and said what aileth thee what wouldest thou then she said lord earl i am in prison i would be free quoth he yea and is this a prison then yea she said since i may not so much as go out from it and come back again unthreatened yet have i been and that unseldom in a worser prison than this do thou go look on the least guard chamber and see if it be a meet dwelling-place for thy master's daughter he spake nought a while and then he said and yet if it grieveth thee it marreth thee nought for when i look on thee mine eyes behold the beauty of the world and the body wherein is no lack she reddened and said if it be so it is god's work and i praise him therefore but how long will it last for grief slayeth beauty he looked on her long and said to thy friends i betook thee and i looked that they should cherish thee where then is the wrong that i have done thee she said maybe no wrong wittingly since now belike thou art come to tell me that all this weary sojourn is at an end that thou wilt take me to medumstead and set me on the throne there and show my father's daughter to all the people he held his peace and his face grew dark before her while she watched it at last he spake in a harsh voice lady he said it may not be here in green harbour must thou abide or in some other castle apart from the folk yea she said now i see it is true that which i foreboded when first i came hither thou wouldst slay me that thou mayest sit safely in the seat of thy master's daughter thou durst not send me a man with a sword to thrust me through therefore thou hast cast me into prison amongst cruel jailers who have been bidden by thee to take my life slowly and with torments hitherto i have withstood their malice and thine but now i am overcome and since i know that i must die i have now no fear and this is why i am bold to tell thee this that i have spoken though i wot now i shall be presently slain and now i tell thee i repent it that i have asked grace of a graceless face 
although she spake strong words it was with a mild and steady voice but the earl was sore troubled and he rose up and walked to and fro of the chamber half drawing his sword and half thrusting it back into the scabbard from time to time at last he came back to her and sat down before her and spake maiden thou art somewhat in error true it is that i would sit firm in my seat and rule the land of medum as belike none other could true it is also that i would have thee the rightful heir dwell apart from the turmoil for a while at least for i would not have thy white hands thrust me untimely from my place or thy fair face held up as a banner by my foeman yet nowise have i willed thy death or thine anguish and if all be true as thou sayest it and thou art so lovely that i know not how to doubt it tell me then what these have done with thee she said sir those friends to whom thou hast delivered me are my foes whether they were thy friends or not wilt thou compel me to tell thee all my shame they have treated me as a thrall who had wiles to play a queen's part in a show to wit thy chaplain whom thou hast given me hast looked on me with lustful eyes and has bidden me buy of him ease and surcease of pain with my very body and hath threatened me more evil else and kept his behest then leapt up the earl and cried out ha did he so then i tell thee this monk's hud shall not be stout enough to save his neck now my child thou speakest tell me more since my hair is whitening she said the sleek smooth-spoken woman to whom thou gavest me didst thou bid her to torment me with stripes and the dungeon and the dark and solitude and hunger nay by all hallows he said nor thought of it trust me she shall pay therefore if so she hath done she said i crave no vengeance but mercy i crave and thou mayst give it me then were they both silent till he said now i for my part will pray thee bear what thou must bear which shall be naught save this that thy queenship lie quiet for a while naught else of evil shall betide thee henceforth but as much of pleasure and joy as may go with it but tell me there is a story of thy snatching a holiday these two days and of a young man whom thou didst happen on tell me now not as a maiden to her father or warder but as a great lady might tell a great lord what be tid betwixt you two for thou art not one on whom a young and doughty man may look unmoved by all hallows but thou art a firebrand my lady and he laughed therewith goldilind flushed red exceeding but she answered steadily lord earl this is the very sooth that i might not fail to see it how he thought me worth looking on but treated me with all honour as a brother might a sister tell me said the earl what like was this man said she he was young but strong beyond measure and full doughty true it is that i saw him with mine eyes take and heave up one of our men in his hands and cast him away as a man would a clod of earth the earl knit his brow yea said he and that story i have heard from the men-at-arms also but what was the man like of aspect she reddened he was of a most goodly body she said fair-eyed and of a face well carven his speech kind and gentle and yet more she reddened said the earl didst thou hear what he was this man she said i deem from his own words that he was but a simple forester yea quoth the earl a simple forester nay but a woodman an outlaw a waylayer so say our men that he fell on them with the cry a tofts a tofts hast thou never heard of jack of the tofts nay never said she said the earl he is the king of these good fellows and a perilous host they be now i fear me if he proven to be one of these there will be a gallows reared for him to-morrow for as fair and as doughty as he may be she turned all pale and her lips quivered then she rose up and fell on her knees before the earl and cried out o oh, sir a grace a grace i pray thee pardon this poor man who was so kind to me the earl raised her up and smiled and said nay my lady queen wouldst thou kneel to me it is unmeet and as for this woodman it is for thee to pardon him and not for me and since by good luck he is not hanged yet thy word hath saved his neck 
she sat down in her chair again but still looked white and scared but the earl spake again and kindly now to all these matters i shall give heed my lady wherefore i will ask leave of thee and be gone and to-morrow i will see thee again and lay some reed before thee meantime be of good cheer for thou shalt be made as much of as may be and live in mickle joy if thou wilt and if any as much as give thee a hard word it shall be the worse for them therewith he arose and made obeisance to her and departed and she abode quiet and looking straight before her till the door shut and then she put her hands to her face and fell a-weeping and scarce knew what ailed her betwixt hope and rest of body and love though that she called not by its right name chapter nineteen earl geoffrey speaketh with christopher now it is to be said that the earl had much tidings told him of christopher and had no intent to put him to death but rather meant to take him into the company of his guard to serve him in all honour and that which he said as to hanging him was but to try goldilind but having heard and seen of her such as we have told he now thought it good to have a privy talk with this young man so he bade a squire lead him to where christopher was held in ward and went much pondering so the squire brought him to the self-same littlest guard-room in sooth a prison where goldilind had lain that other morn and he gave the squire leave and entered and shut the door behind him so that he and christopher were alone together the young man was lying on his back on the pallet with his hands behind his head and his knees drawn up murmuring some fag-end of an old song but when he heard the door shut to he sat up and turning to the newcomer said art thou tidings if so then tell me quickly which is it to be the gallows or freedom friend said the earl sternly dost thou know who i am nay said christopher by thine attire thou shouldst be some great man but that is of little matter to me since thou wilt neither bid slay me or let me go for a heedless word quoth the earl i am the master of the land of meadham so there is no need to tell thee that i have thy life or death in my hand now thou wilt not deny that thou art of the company of jack of the toffs it is sooth said christopher well said the earl thou art bold then to have come hither for thou sayest it that thou art a wolf's head and forfeit of thy life now again thou didst take the lady of meadham home to thy house yesterday and wert with her alone a great while now according to thy dealings with her thou dost merit either the most evil of deaths or else it may be a reward ha what sayest thou christopher leapt up and said in a loud voice lord king whatsoever i may be i am not each man's dastard when i saw that pearl of all women i loved her indeed as who should not but it was even as i had loved the mother of god had she come down from the altar picture at the church of middleham of the wood and whoso saith otherwise i give him the lie back in his teeth and will meet him face to face if i may and then meseems it will go hard with him spake the earl laughing i will be no champion against thee for i hold my skin and my bones of too much price thereto and moreover though meseemeth the blessed virgin would have a hot lover in thee were she to come down to earth and nigh thy dwelling yet trow i thy tale that thou hast dealt with my lady in honour therefore lad what sayest thou wilt thou be a man of mine and bear arms for me and do my will spake christopher lord this is better than hanging why so it is lad said the earl laughing again as some would say better by a good deal but hearken if thou take it thou must abide here in green harbour a long while maybe yea even so long as my lady dwelleth here christopher flushed and said lord thou art kind and gracious and i will take thy bidding the earl said well so it shall be then and presently thou shalt go out of this guard-room a free man but abide a while therewith he drew a stool to him and sat down and spake not for a long while and christopher abode his pleasure at last spake the earl one day may happen we may make a wedding for thee and that no ill one christopher laughed lord said he what lady will wed me and no man's son said the earl not if the lord of meadham be thy friend well then 
how if the lady and queen of Medum make thee the wedding said christopher i will leave her to make mine own wedding when so i need a woman in my bed i will compel no woman nor ask others to compel her the earl rose up and fell to pacing the prison to and fro and at last he stood over against christopher and said hearken forester i will foretell thy fortune it is that thou shalt become great by wedding christopher held his peace and the earl spake again now is the shortest word best we deem thee both goodly and doughty and would wed thee to a great lady even that one to whom thou hast shown kindness in the wilderness said christopher it is the want of great laws to mock poor folk therefore i must not show anger against thee i mock thee not said the earl i mean naught but as my words say nay then said christopher thou biddest me an evil deed great lord what i said was that i would compel no woman and shall i compel her who is the wonder of the world and my very own lady hold thy peace sir fool said the earl let me tell thee that she is as like to compel thee as thou her and as to her being thy lady she shall be thy lady and wife indeed but not here for above all things will she get her away from green harbour and thou shalt be her champion to lead her about the world like a knight-errant now was christopher so troubled that he knew not what countenance to make and scarce might he get a word out of his mouth a long while at last he said lord i see that i must needs do thy will if this be no trap which thou hast set for me but over wonderful it is that a great lady should be wedded to a gangrel churl the earl laughed many a fairly fair to the fair-eyed quoth he and also will i tell thee in thine ear that this lady may not be so great as her name is great did she praise her life days to thee nay said christopher i mind me well she called herself the poor captive she said but sooth quoth the earl and her going away from green harbour is instead of her captivity and i tell thee it is by that only i may make her joyous and now one word thou that criest out for the toffs in battle art not altogether unfriended meseemeth christopher looked up proudly and fiercely he said forsooth lord my friends are good though thou callest them wolfheads and gallows meat champion said the earl laughing that may well be sooth and there are many ups and downs in the world but think thee that the time may come when thou and thy friends may win to my help and may win the names of knight and baron and earl such hap hath been aforetime and now i crave of thee when thou comest back to the tofts to bid jack fall upon other lands than medum when he rideth because of the gift and wedding that i give thee now so lad i deem that thou hast chosen thy part but let not the tale thereof go out of thy mouth or thou wilt gab away thy wedding lo thou i leave this door open behind me and presently shall the smith come here to do away with thine irons and i shall send a squire to thee to lead thee to a fair chamber and to bring thee goodly raiment and do thou play amongst thy fellows as one of the best of them and show them if thou wilt some such feats in peace as yesterday thou showest them in battle and to-morrow there will be new tidings and therewith he departed no worse than his word he was and anon came the smith and the squire and he was brought to a chamber and raiment of fine linen and silk and embroidery was brought to him and when he was new clad he looked like a king's son whereas aforetime he looked like a god of the gentiles of old all men praised his beauty and his courtesy and after dinner was and they had rested they bade him play with them and show them his prowess and he was not loath thereto and did what he might in running and leaping and casting of the bar and shooting in the bow and in all these things he was so far before every one that they marvelled at him and said it was well indeed that he had not been slain yesterday as to wrestling therein he might do but little for all forbore him after the first man had stood before him a squire well learned in war and long and tough and deemed a very stark man him christopher threw over his shoulder as though he had been a child of twelve years 
so wore the day at green harbour in merrier wise for all good folk than for many a day had been the want there End of part five Part six of Child Christopher and Goldilyn the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty of the Wedding of Christopher and Goldilyn. Early on the morrow came the Earl unto Goldilyn, and she received him gladly, as one who had fashioned life anew for her. And when he had sat down by her, he spake and said, Lady, thou cravest of me yesterday two things the first was freedom from the captivity of green harbour and the second life and liberty for the varlet that cherished thee in the wildwood the other day now thy first asking grieved me for that thou hast been tyrannously done by and thy second i wondered at but since i have seen the young man i wonder the less for he is both so goodly and so mighty of body and of speech bold and free yet gentle and of all courtesy that he is meet to be knight or earl yea or very king now therefore in both these matters i will do well to thy pleasure and in one way it may be and thou mayst then go forth from green harbour as free as a bird and thy varlet's life may be given unto him and mickle honour therewith art thou then willing to do after my rede and my commandment so that both these good things may betide thee right willing am i she said to be free and happy and to save the life of a fair youth and kind then said he there is one thing for thee to do that this day thou wed this fair and kind youth and let him lead thee forth from green harbour and belike he will bring thee to no ill stead for his friends are mightier than may happen thou deemest she turned as red as blood at his word she knit her brows and her eyes flashed as she answered is it seemly for a king's daughter to wed a nameless churl and now i know thee lord earl what thou wouldst do thou wouldst be king of Meadham and put thy master's daughter to the road and she was exceeding wroth but he said smiling somewhat was it then seemly for the king's daughter to kneel for this man's life and to go near swooning for joy when it was granted to her yea she said for i love him with all my body and soul and i would have had him love me par amour and then should i have been his mistress and he my servant but now shall he be my master and i his servant and still was she very wroth quoth the earl as to the matter of my being king of meadham that will i be whatever befall nor die in the place else so if thou wilt not do my rede then must the varlet whom thou lovest die and at green harbour must thou abide with dame eleanor there is no help for it she shrieked out at that word of his and well nigh swooned lying back in her chair but presently fell a weeping sorely but the earl said hearken my lady i am not without warrant to do this tell me hast thou ever seen any fairer or doughtier than this youngling never said she so say we all he said now i shall tell thee and i can bring witness to it that in his last hour the king thy father when he gave thee into my keeping spake also this that i should wed thee to none save the fairest and doughtiest man that might be found even so would i do now what then sayest thou she answered not but still wept somewhat then said the earl lady give me leave and i shall send thy women to thee and sit in the great hall for an hour and within that while thou send a woman of thine to say one word yes unto me then all is well but if not then do i depart from green harbour straightway and take the youngling with me to hang him up on the first tree be wise i pray thee and therewith he went his ways but goldilind being left alone a little rose up and paced the chamber to and fro and her tears and sobbing ceased and a great and strange joy grew up in her heart mingled with the pain of longing so that she might rest in no wise even therewith the door opened and her women entered aloise first and she called to her at once and bade her to find earl geoffrey in the great hall and say to him yes so aloise went her ways 
and Goldilind bade her other women to array her in the best and goodliest wise that they might, and the day was yet somewhat young. Now it must be, be said of Earl Geoffrey that in spite of his hard word, he had it not in his heart either to slay Christopher or to leave Goldilind at Green Harbour to the mercy of Dame Eleanor. Chapter 21 Of the Wedding of Those Twain now were folk gathered in the hall, and the Earl Geoffrey was standing on the dais by the high seat, and beside him a worthy clerk, the abbot of Meadhamstead, a monk of St. Benedict, and next to him the Burgreave of Green Harbour, and then a score of knights, all in brave raiment, and squires withal, and sergeants. But down in the hall were the men-at-arms and serving-men, and a half-hundred of folk of the countryside, queens as well as carls, who had been gathered for the show and bidden in. No other women were there in the hall till Goldilind and her serving women entered. She went straight up the hall and took her place in the high seat, and for all that her eyes seemed steady, she had noted Christopher standing by the shot window just below the dais. Now when she was set down and there was silence in the hall, Earl Geoffrey came forth and said, lords and knights and ye good people the lady goldilind daughter of the lord king roland that last was is now of age to wed and be it known unto you that the king her father bade me in the last words by him spoken to wed her to none but the loveliest and strongest that might be as witness i can bring hereto now such a man have i sought hereto in meadhamstead and the much-peopled land of Meadham, and none have I come on, however worthy he were of deeds, or well born of lineage, but that I doubted me if he were so fair or so doughty as might be found. But here in this half-desert corner of the land have I gotten a man than whom none is doughtier, as some of you have found to your cost. And tell me, all you, where have ye seen any as fair as this man? And therewith he made a sign with his hand, and forth strode Christopher up onto the dais, and he was so clad that his kirtle was of white samite, girt with a girdle of goldsmith's work, whereby hung a good sword of like fashion, and over his shoulders was a mantle of red cloth of gold, furred with ermine and lined with green sendal, and on his golden curled locks sat a chaplet of pearls. Then to the lords and all the people he seemed so fair and fearless and kind, that they gave a great shout of welcome, and Goldilind came forth from her chair, as fair as a June lily, and came to Christopher, and reached out her hand to him. But he refrained him a moment, so that all they could see how sweet and lovely a hand it was. And then he took it, and drew her to him, and kissed her mouth before them all, and still he held her hand till the abbot of Meadhamstead, aforetold, came and stood by them, and blessed them. Then spake the earl again, Lo ye, here hath been due betrothal of these twain, and ye may see how meet they be for each other in goodliness and kindness. Now there lacketh naught but they should be wedded straightway, and all is arrayed in the chapel, wherefore if this holy man will come with us, and do on his mass-hackle, our joy shall be fulfilled save that thereafter shall feast and merriment await all you in this hall and we shall be there to welcome all comers in this house of green harbour whereas this our gracious lady has long abided so happily man looked on man here and there and smiled a little as he spake but none said aught for there were none save the earl's servants there and a sort of poor wretches so therewithal they went their ways to the chapel where was the wedding done as grandly as might be, considering they were in no grander place than Green Harbour, and when all was done, and folk began to flow away from the chapel, and Goldilin sat shamed-faced but strangely happy in a great stall of the choir, the earl called Christopher unto him, and said, My lad, I deem that some great fortune shall betide thee, since already thou hast begun so luckily but i beseech thee mar not thy fortune by coming back with thy fair wife to the land of meadham or else it may be thou shalt cast thy life away and that will bring her sorrow 
as I can see well. He spake this grimly, though he smiled as he spake, but he went on more gently. I will not send you twain away empty-handed. When ye go out a gates into the wide world, ye shall find two fair horses for your riding, well bedight, and one with a woman's saddle, and moreover a sumpter beast not very lightly burdened, for on one side of him he beareth a chest, wherein is, first of all, the raiment of my lady, and beneath it some deal of silver and gold and gems, but on the other side is victual and drink for the way for you, and raiment for thee, youngling. How sayest thou, is it well? It is well, lord, said Christopher, yet would I have with me the raiment wherewith I came hither, and my bow and my sacks. Yea, and wherefore, Carl? said Earl Geoffrey. Said the youngling, we be going to ride the wildwood, and it might be better for safety's sake that I be so clad as certain folk look to see men ride there. But he reddened as he spake, and the earl said, By all hallows, but it is not ill thought of, and belike the same like kind of attire might be better to hide the queenship of the lady from the wood folk than that which she now weareth. True is that, lord, quoth Christopher. Yet, said the earl, I will have you go forth from the castle clad in your lordly weed, lest folk of mine say that I have stripped my lady and cast her forth. Don ye your poor raiment, when in the wood ye be. Therewith he called to a squire, and bade him seek out that poor raiment of the new-wedded youngling, and bow withal, and shafts good store, and do all on the sumpter. And furthermore he bade him tell one of my lady's women to set on the sumpter, some of Goldilin's old and used raiment. So the squire did the earl's will, and both got Christopher's gear, and also found Aloise, and gave her the earl's word. She smiled thereat, and went straightway and fetched the very same raiment, green gown and all, which she had brought to Goldilind in prison that other day, and in which Goldilind had fled from Green Harbour. And when she had done them in the chest above all the other gear, she stood yet beside the horses amidst of the varlets and squires who were gathered there to see the new wedded folk depart presently then came forth through the gates these two hand in hand and earl geoffrey with them and he set goldilind on her horse himself and knelt before her to say farewell and therewith was christopher on his horse and him the earl saluted debonairly but just as they were about shaking their reins to depart, Aloise fell down on her knees before the earl, who said, What is toward, woman? A grace, my lord, a grace, said she. Stand up on thy feet, said the earl, and ye, my masters, draw out of earshot. Even so did they, and the earl bade her speak, and she said, Lord, my lady is going away from Green Harbour, and anon thou wilt be going and I shall be left with the sleek she-devil yonder that thou hast set over us, and here there will be hell for me without escape, now that my lady is gone. Wherefore, I pray thee, take me with thee to Medemstead, even if it be to prison, for here I shall die the worst of deaths. Earl Geoffrey smiled on her sourly, and said, If it be as I understand that thou hast lifted thine hand against my lady, wert thou wending with me, thou shouldst go just so far as the first tree. Thou mayst deem thyself lucky if I leave thee behind here, nor needest thou trouble thee concerning Dame Eleanor. Little more shalt thou hear of her henceforward. But Goldilin spake and said, My lord Earl, I would ask grace for this one, for what she did to me she did compelled, and not of her free will, and I forgive it her. And moreover, this last time she suffered in her body for the helping of me, so if thou mightest do her asking, I were the better pleased. It shall be as thou wilt, my lady, said the earl, and I will have her with me, and keep her quiet in Meadhamstead. But by all hallows, had it not been for thy word, we would have had her whipped into the wild wood, and hanged up unto a tree thereafter. Then Aloise knelt before Goldilind, and kissed her feet, and wept, and drew back pale and trembling. But Goldilin shook her rein once for all now, and her apple-grey horse went forth with her. Christopher came after, leading the sumpter beast, and forth they went, and passed over the open green about the castle, and came on to the woodland way, 
whereby Goldilind had fled that other time. Chapter 22 Of the Woodland Bride Chamber They rode in silence a good way, and it was some three hours after noon, and the day as fair and bright as might be. Christopher held his peace for sweet shame that he was alone with a most fair maid, and she his own, and without defence against him. But she, amidst of her silence, turned, now red, and now somewhat pale, and now and again she looked somewhat askance on him, and he deemed her looks were no kinder than they should be. At last she spake, yet not looking on him, and said, So, Forrester, now is done what I must needs do. Thy life is saved, and I am quit of Green Harbour and its prison, and its torments. Whither away, then? Quoth he, all dismayed, for her voice was the voice of anger. I wot not whither, save to the house thou hast blessed already with thy dear body. At that word she turned quite pale and trembled, and spake not for a while, and smote her horse and hastened on the way, and he after her. But when he was come up with her again, then she said, still not looking at him, A house of woodmen and wolfheads, is that a meet dwelling place for me? Didst thou hear men at Green Harbour say that I am a queen? Hear them I did, quoth he, but me seemeth naught like a queen had they done with thee. She said, And dost thou mock me with that, thou? And she burst out weeping. He answered not, for sore grief smote him, remembering her hand in his but a little while ago, and again she hurried on, and he followed her. When he came up with her, she said, And thou, didst thou woo me as a queen? Lady, he said, I wooed thee not at all. I was given to thee. Would I, would I not? Great joy was that to me. Then said she, Thou sayest sooth, thou hast not wooed me, but taken me. She laughed therewith as one in bitterness, but presently she turned to him, and he wondered, for in her face was longing and kindness naught like to her words. But he durst not speak to her, lest he should anger her, and she turned her face from him again, and she said, Wert thou given to me? Me seems I was given to thee, would I, would I not? The queen to the churl, the woodman, the wolfhead. And again she rode on, and he followed, sick at heart, and wondering sorely. When they were riding together again, they spake not to each other, though she stole glances at him to see how he fared. But he rode on with knit brows and a stern countenance. So in a while she began to speak to him again, but as if there were naught but courtesy between them, and neither love nor hatred. She fell to asking him of woodland matters, concerning bird and beast and things creeping, and at first he would scarce answer her at all, and then were his answers short. But at last, despite of all, he began to forget both grief and anger, so much the sweetness of her speech wound about his heart. And withal, she fell to asking him of his fellows and their life in the woods, and of Jack of the Toffs and the like. And now he answered her questions fully, and while she laughed at his words, and he laughed also, and all pleasure had there been of this converse, if he had not beheld her from time to time, and longed for the fairness of her body, and feared her wrath at his longing. So wore the day, and the sun was getting low, and they were come to another woodland pool, which was fed by a clear-running little brook, and up from it went a low bank of greensward, exceeding sweet, and beyond that oak-trees, wide-branched and great, and still fair greensward beneath them, and hazel thickets beyond them. There, then, Goldilind reined up and looked about her, but Christopher looked on her and naught else. But she said, "'Let to-morrow bring counsel, but now I am weary to-night, and if we are not to ride night long, we shall be like find no better place to rest in. Wilt thou keep watch while I sleep? Yea, he said, bowing his head to her soberly, and therewith he got off his horse and would have helped her down from hers. But she slipped lightly down and stood before him face to face, and they were very nigh to each other, she standing close to her horse. Her face was pale to his deeming, and there was a piteous look in her eyes, so that he yearned towards her in his bowels, and reached his hand toward her. But she shrank aback, 
leaning against her horse and said in a trembling voice looking full at him and growing yet paler forester dost thou think it seemly that thou shouldst ride with us thou such as thou hast told thyself to be in this lordly raiment which they gave thee yonder as part of the price for thy leading us away into the wild wood lady said he whether it be seemly or not i see that it is thy will that i should go clad as a woodland churl abide a little and thy will shall be done therewith he did off the burden from the sumpter horse and set the chests on the earth and then he took her horse gently and led him with the other two in under the oak trees and there he tethered them so that they could bite the grass and came back thereafter and took his old raiment out of the chest and said what thou wilt have me do i will do now and this all the more as to-morrow i should have done it unbidden and should have prayed thee to do on garments less glorious than now thou bearest so that we may look the less strange in the woodland if we chance to fall in with any man nor she answered as he turned toward the hazel copse she had been following him with her eyes while he was about that business and when his back was turned she stood a moment till her bosom fell a heaving and she wept then she turned her about to the chest wherein was her raiment and went hastily and did off her glorious array and did on the green gown wherewith she had fled and left her feet bare withal then she looked up and saw christopher how he was coming out from the hazel thicket new clad in his old raiment and she cried out aloud and ran toward him but he doubted that some evil had betid and that she was chased so he drew out his sword but she ran up to him and cried out put up thy sword here is none save me but he stood still gazing on her in wonderment and now she was drawn near to him she stood still before him panting then he said nay lady for this night there was no need of thy disguising thee to-morrow it had been soon enough she said i were fain if thou wouldst take my hand and lead me back to our resting-place even so he did and as their palms met he felt how her hand loved him and a flood of sweetness swept over his heart and made an end of all its soreness but he led her quietly back again to their place then she turned to him and said now art thou the woodland god again and the courtier no more so now will i worship thee and she knelt down before him and embraced his knees and kissed them but he drew her up to him and cast his arms about her and kissed her face many times and said now art thou the poor captive again she said now hast thou forgiven me but i will tell thee that my wilfulness and folly was not all utterly feigned though when i was about it i longed for thee to break it down with the fierceness of a man and bid me to look to it how helpless i was and thou how strong and my only defence not utterly feigned it was for i will say it that i was grieved to the heart when i bethought me of Medhamstead and the seat of my father's what sayest thou then shalt thou ever be a woodman in these thickets and a follower of jack of the toffs if so thou wilt it is well he took her by the shoulders and bent her backwards to kiss her and held her up above the earth in his arms waving her this way and that till she felt how little and light she was in his grasp though she was no puny woman then he set her on her feet again and laughed in her face and said sweetling let to-morrow bring counsel but let it all be thou hast said it thou art weary so now will i dight thee a bed of our mantles and thou shalt lie thee down and i shall watch thee as thou badest me therewith he went about and plucked armfuls of the young bracken and made a bed wide and soft and spread the mantles thereover but she stood a while looking on him then she said dost thou think to punish me for my wilful folly and to shame me by making me speak to thee nay he said it is not so she said i am not shamed in that i say to thee if thou watch this night i will watch by thee and if i lie down to rest this night thou shalt lie by me for my foemen have given me to thee and now shalt thou give thyself to me so he drew near to her shyly like unto one who hath been forgiven and there was their bridal bed 
and naught but the oak boughs betwixt them and the bare heavens chapter twenty three they fall in with friends now awoke goldilind when the morning was young and fresh and she drew the mantle up over her shoulders and as she did so but half awake she deemed she heard other sounds than the singing of the blackbirds and throstles about the edge of the thicket and she turned her eyes toward the oak trees and the hazel thicket and saw at once three of mankind coming on foot over the greensward toward her she was afraid so that she durst not put out a hand to awaken christopher but sat gazing on those three as they came toward her she saw that two were tall men clad much as christopher but presently she saw that there was a woman with them and she took heart somewhat thereat and she noted that one of the men was short-haired and dark-haired and the other had long red hair falling about his shoulders and as she put out her hand and laid it on christopher's shoulder the red-haired one looked toward her a moment under the sharp of his hand for the sun was on their side and then set off running giving out a great whoop therewithal even therewith leapt up christopher still half awake and the red-haired man ran right up to him and caught him by the shoulders and kissed him on both cheeks so that goldilin saw that these were the fellows whereof christopher had told and she stood there shamefast and smiling presently came up the others to wit gilbert and joanna and they also kissed and embraced christopher and all they were as full of joy as might be then came joanna to goldilind and said i wot not who this may be brother yet me seems she will be some one who is dear to thee wherefore is she my sister and therewith she kissed goldilind and she was kind and sweet of flesh and goodly of body and goldilind rejoiced in her joanna made much of her and said to her here is to do whereas two men have broken into a lady's chamber come sister let us to the thicket and i will be thy tiring maid and while these others tell their tales we shall tell ours and she took her hand and they went into the hazels but the two new-come men seemed to find it hard to keep their eyes off goldilind till the hazels had hidden her then turned david to christopher and said thy pardon little king that we have waked thee so early but we wotted not that thou hast been among the wood-women and sooth to say my lad we had little ease till we found thee after we came home and saw all those hoof-marks yonder yea said gilbert if we had lost thee we had been finely holpen up for we could never have gone back to the toffs nor into the kingdom for i think my father would have hanged us if we had come back with a by the way christopher is slain but tell us lad what hath befallen thee with yonder sweetening yea tell us said david and sit down here betwixt us with thy back to the hazel thicket and we shall get no tale out of thee tush man joanna will bring her back and that right soon i hope christopher laughed and sat down between them and told all how it had gone with him and of goldilind who she was the others hearkened heedfully and gilbert said with aught thou hast told us brother it is clear we shall find it hard to dwell in little dale so soon as thy loveling hath rested her at our house we must go our ways to the tofts and take counsel of our father christopher yea said this and therewithal was come joanna leading goldilind duly arrayed yet still in her green gown for she would none other fresh blushing and all lovely and david and christopher did obeisance before her as to a great lady but she hailed them as brothers merrily and kindly and bade them kiss her and they kissed her cheek but shyly and especially david thereafter they broke their fast under the oak trees and spent a merry hour and then departed the two women riding the horses the others afoot so they came to the house of little dale some while before sunset and were merry and glad there young they were troubles were behind them and many a joy before them chapter twenty four they take counsel at little dale ten days they abode in the house of little dale in all good cheer and joanna led goldilind here and there about the woods and made much of her so that the heart within her was full of joy for the freedom of the wild woods and all the life thereof 
was well nigh new to her whereas on the day of her flight from green harbour and on two other such times deadly fear as is aforesaid was mingled with her joyance and would have drowned it utterly but for the wilfulness which hardened her heart against the punishment to come but now she was indeed free and it seemed to her as to christopher when he was but new healed of his hurt as if all this bright beauty of tree and flower and beast and bird was but made for her alone and she wondered that her fellow could be so calm and sedate amidst all of this pleasure and now forsooth was her queenhood forgotten and better and better to her seemed christopher's valiant love and the meeting in the hall of the eventide was so sweet to her that she might do little but stand trembling whilst christopher came up to her and joanna's trim feet were speeding her over the floor to meet her man that she might be a sharer in his deeds of the day many tales withal joanna told the queen of the deeds of her husband and his kindred and of the freeing of her and the other three from their captivity at wailing no and of the evil days they wore there before the coming of their lads which must have been worser by far thought goldilin than the days of green harbour so with all these tales and the happy days in the house of the wild woods goldilin now began to deem of this new life as if there had been none other fated for her so much apart was she now become of the days of those woodmen and wolfheads but when the last of those ten days was wearing to an end and those five were sitting happy in the hall albeit david sat somewhat pensive now staring at goldilin's beauty now rising from his seat to pace the floor restlessly gilbert spake and said brethren and thou queen goldilind it may be that the time is drawing near for other deeds than letting fly a few shafts at the dun deer and eating our meat and singing old songs as we lie at our lady's feet for though we be at peace here in the wild wood forgetting all things save those that are worthy to be remembered yet in the cities and the courts of kings guile is not forgotten and pride is alive and tyranny and the sword is wetted for innocent lives and the feud is eked by the destruction of those who will be sackless of its upheaving wherefore it behoveth to defend us by the ready hand and the bold heart and the wise head so i say let us loiter here no longer but go our ways to-morrow to the tofts and take the reed of our elders how say ye brethren quoth christopher time was brother when what thou sayest would have been as a riddle to me and i would have said here we are merry though we be few and if ye lack more company let me ride to the tofts and come back with half a score of lads and lasses and thus let us eke our mirth and maybe they will tell us whitherward to ride but now there is a change since i have gained a gift over great for me and i know that they shall be some of the great ones who would be eager to take it from me and who knows what guile may be about the weaving even now as on the day when thou first sawest this hall beloved goldilin spake and sighed withal whither my lord will lead me thither i will go but here is it fair and sweet and peaceful neither do i look for it that men will come hither to seek the queen of Medum. david said bethink thee though my lady that he who wedded thee to the woodman may yet rue and come hither to undo his deed by slaying the said woodman and showing the queen unto the folk goldilin turned pale but joanna spake nay brother david why wilt thou prick her heart with this fear for my part i think that chance hap apart we might dwell here for years in all safety and happily enough maybe yet also i say that we of the toffs may well be eager to show this jewel to our kindred and especially to our father and mother of the toffs so to-morrow we will set about the business of carrying her thither will she nil she and therewith she threw her arms about goldilind and clipped her and kissed her and goldilind reddened for pleasure and for joy that she was so sore prized by them all end of part six part seven of child christopher and goldilind the fair by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five now they all come to the tofts next morning while the day was yet young they rode together all of them 
the nighest way to the tops, for they knew the wood right well. Again they slept one night under the bare heavens, and, rising betimes on the morrow, came out under the tops some four hours after high noon, on as fair and calm a day of early summer as ever was seen. They rode straight up to the door of the great hall, and found but few folk about, and these mostly women and children. Jack was ridden abroad, they said, but they looked to see him back to supper, him and his sons, for he was no great way gone. Meantime, when they got off their horses, the women and children thronged round about them, and the children especially about Christopher, whom they loved much. The maidens also would not have him pass into the hall unkissed, though presently, after their faces had felt his lips, they fell a-staring and wondering at Goldilind, and when Christopher took her by the hand and gave her welcome to the house of the Toffs, and they saw that she was his, they grew to be somewhat afraid, or it might be shy, both of her and of him. Anyhow, folk came up to them in the hall, and made much of them, and took them on to chambers, and washed their feet, and crowned them with flowers, and brought them into the hall again, and up on to the dais, and gave them to eat and drink. Thither came to them also the Lady Margaret, Jack's wedded wife, and made them the most cheer that she might, and unto her did Christopher tell his story, as unto his very mother, and what there was in the house, both of Carl and Queen, gathered round about to hearken, and Christopher nothing loath. And Goldilin's heart warmed toward that folk, and in sooth they were a goodly people to look on, and frank and happy, and of good will, and could well of courtesy, though it were not of the courts. Wore the bright day, and it drew toward sunset, and now the carls came straight into the hall by twos and threes, till there were a many within its walls. But to each one of these knots as they entered, some one, carl or queen, spake a word or two, and straightway the newcomers went up to the dais and greeted Christopher pleasantly, and made obeisance to Goldilind. At last was the hall, so quiet erst, grown busy as a beehive, and amidst the throng thereof came in the serving folk, women and men, and set endlong boards up, for the high table was a standing one of oak, bright, thick and strong. And then they fell to bringing in the service, all but what the fire was dealing with in the kitchen, and whilst this was a-doing, the sun was sinking fast, and it was dusk in the hall by then it was done, though without the sky was fair and golden. And about the edges of the thicket were the nightingales singing loud and sweet, but within was the turmoil of many voices, whereof few heeded if their words were loud or soft. Amidst all this, from close to the hall, rang out the sound of many horns, winding a woodland tune. None was afeard or astonished, because all knew it for the horns of Jack of the Tofts, but they stilled their chattering talk somewhat, and abided his coming, and even therewith came the sound of many feet and the clash of weapons, and men poured in, and there was the gleam of steel, as folk fell back to the right and left, and gave room to the newcomers. Then a loud, clear, and cheery voice cried out from amidst of them, Light in the hall, men and maids, candles, candles, let's see who is here before us. Straightway then was their running hither and thither, and light sprang up over all the hall, and there could folk see of Jack of the Toffs, and a score and a half of his best, every man of them armed with shield and helm and burney, with green coats over their armour, and wreaths of young oak about their bassnets. There they stood amidst of the hall, and every man with his naked sword in his fist. Jack stood before his folk, clad in likewise with them, save that his head was bare but for an oak wreath. Men looked on a while and said naught, while Jack looked proudly and keenly over the hall, and at last his eye caught Christopher's, but he made the youngling no semblance of greeting. Christopher's heart fell, and he misdoubted if something were not wrong, but he spake softly to one who stood by him and said, Is all to miss, Will Ashcroft? This is not the want here, said the other. Not in my time, but for the last seven days it hath been the want, and then off weapons and to supper peaceably. Chapter twenty six of the King of Oakenrealm. 
even therewith and while the last word had but come to christopher's ears rang out the voice of jack of the toffs again louder and clearer than before and he said men in this hall i bear you tidings the king of oakenrealm is amongst us to-night then forsooth was the noise and the turmoil and cries and shouts and clatter and fists raised in air and weapons caught down from the wall and the glitter of spear points and a gleam of fallow blades for the name of rolf king of oakenrealm was to those woodmen as the name of the great devil of hell so much was he their unfriend and their dastard but jack raised up his hand and cried silence ye blow up the horns the hunt's up blared out the horns then strong and fierce under the hall roof and when they were done there was more silence in the hall than summer night without only the voice of the swords could not be utterly still but yet tinkled and rang as hard came against hard here and there in the hush again spake jack let no man speak let no man move from his place i see the king ye shall see him therewith he strode up the hall and on to the dais and came up to where stood christopher holding goldie lynn's hand and she all pale and trembling but jack took him by the shoulder and turned him about toward a seat which stood before the board so that all men in the hall could see it then he set him down in it and took his sword from his girdle and knelt down before the young man and took his right hand and said in a loud voice i jack of the toffs a free man and a sackless wrongfully beguilted am the man of king christopher of oakenrealm to live and die for him as need may be lo lord my father's blade wilt thou be good to me and gird me therewith as thy father girt him now when christopher heard him at first he deemed that all this was some sport or play done for his pastime and the pleasure of the hall folk in all kindness and honour but when he looked in the eyes of him and saw him fierce and eager and true he knew well it was no jest and as the shouts of men went up from the hall and beat against the roof him seemed that he remembered as in a dream folk talking anigh him when he was too little to understand of a king and his son and a mighty man turned thief and betrayer then his brow cleared and his eyes shone bright and he leaned forward to jack and girt him with the sword and kissed his mouth and said thou art indeed my man and my thane and my earl and i gird thee with thy sword as my father girded thy father then stood up jack of the toffs and said men in this hall happy is the hour and happy are ye this man is the king of oakenrealm and he yonder is but a thief of kings a dastard and again great was the shouting for carl and queen young and old they loved christopher well and jack of the toffs was not only their war-duke and alderman but their wise man also and none had any thought of gainsaying him but he spake again and said is there here any old man or not so old who hath of past days seen our king that was king christopher to wit who fell in battle on our behalf if so there be let him come up hither then arose a greybeard from a bench nigh the high table and came up onto the dais a very tall man had he been but was now somewhat bowed by age he now leant before christopher and took his hand and said ay william of Whittenham, a free man a knight sackless of the guilt which is laid on me would be thy man o my lord king to serve thee in all wise if so be that i may live to strike one stroke for my master's son whom now i see the very living image of the king whom i served in my youth then christopher bent down to him and kissed him and said thou art indeed my man and my thane and my baron and who knows but that thou mayst have many a stroke to strike for me in the days that are nigh at hand and again the people shouted and then there came another and another and ten more squires and knights and men of estate who were now indeed woodmen and wolfheads but who the worst of them were sackless of aught save slaying an unfriend or a friend's unfriend in fair fight and all these kneeled before him and put their hands in his and gave themselves unto him 
when this was done there came thrusting through the throng of the hall a tall woman old yet comely as for her age she went right up on to the dais and came to where sat christopher and without more ado cast her arms about him and kissed him and then she held him by the shoulders and cried out oh have i found thee at last my loveling and my dear and my nurse chick and thou grown so lovely and yet so big that i may never more hold thee aloft in mine arms as once i was wont though high enough belike thou shalt be lifted and i say praise be to god and his hallows that thou art grown so beauteous and mighty a man therewith she turned about toward the hall throng and said thou duke of these woodmen and all ye in this hall i have been brought hither by one of you and though i have well nigh died of joy because of the suddenness of this meeting yet i thank him therefore for who is this goodly and gracious young man save the king's son of oakenrealm christopher that was and that to my certain knowledge for he is my fosterling and my milk-child and i took him from the hands of the midwife in the high house of oakenham at twenty-one years ago and they took him from oakenham and me with him to the house of lord richard the lean at longholms and there we dwelt but in a little while they took him away from longholms to i know not whither but would not suffer me to go along with him and ever since thence have i been wandering about and hoping to see this lovely child again and now i see him what he is and again i thank god and all hallows therefore once more then was there stir and glad tumult in the hall but goldilin stood wondering and fear entered into her soul for she saw before her a time of turmoil and unpeace and there seemed too much between her and the sweetness of her love withal it must be said that for as little as she knew of courts and war hosts she yet seemed to see lands without that hall and hosts marching and mighty walls glittering with spears and the banners of a great king displayed and jack of the toffs and his champions and good fellows seemed but a frail defence against all that when once the hidden should be shown and the scantiness of the woodland should cry on the abundance of the kingdom to bow down now she came round the board and stood beside christopher and he turned to her and stood up and took her hand in such wise that she felt the caress of it and joy filled her soul as if she had been alone with him in the wild wood but he spake and said all ye my friends i see and wot well that ye would have me sit in my father's seat and be the king of oakenrealm and that ye will give me help and furtherance therein to the utmost nor will i cast back the gift upon you and i will say this that when i am king indeed it is my meaning and my will now that then i shall be no less one of you good fellows and kind friends than ye have known me hitherto and even so i deem that ye think of me but good friends it is not to be hidden that the road ye would have me wend with you is like to be rough and it may well be that we shall not come to be kings or kings friends but men hunted and often may be men taken and slain therefore till one thing or the other come the kingship or the taking i will try to be no less joyous than now i am and so meseemeth shall ye and if ye be of this mind then shall the coming days be no worse than the days which have been and god wot they have been happy enough now again ye see this most fair lady whose hand i hold she is my beloved and my wife and therewithal she is the true queen of medum and a traitor sits in her place even as a traitor sits in mine but i must tell you that when she took me for her beloved she knew not nor did i that i was a king's son but she took me as a woodman and an outcast and as a woodman and outcast i wooed her trusting in the might that was in my body and the love that was in my heart and now before all you my friends i thank her and worship her that my body and my love was enough for her as god wot the kingship of the whole earth should not be over much for her if it lay open to her to take but sweet friends here am i talking of myself as a king wedded unto a queen whereas me seemeth the chiefest gift our twin kingship hath brought you to-night is the gift of two most mighty unfriends for you to wit her foeman and mine see ye to it then if the wild wood yonder is not a meeter dwelling for us than this your goodly hall 
had fear not to put us to the door as a pair of make-baits and a peril to this goodly company lo you the sky without has not yet lost all memory of the sun and in a little while it will be yellowing again to the dawn nought evil shall be the wild wood for our summer dwelling and what ere the winter come we may have won as another house where erst my fathers feasted and thereto my friends do i bid you all but when they heard his friendly words and saw the beauty of the fair woman whose hand he held his face grew so well beloved to them that they cried out with so great a voice of cheer wordless for their very joy that the timbers of the hall quavered because of it and it went out into the wildwood as though it had been the feastful roaring of the ancient gods of the forest but when the tumult sank a little then cried out jack of the toffs bring now the mickle shield and let us look upon our king so men went and fetched in a huge ancient shield plated with berry brown iron inlaid with gold and the four biggest men in the hall took it on their shoulders and knelt down anigh the dais before christopher and jack said aloud king king stand up here for this warboard of old days is the castle and the burg alone due to thee and these four fellows here are the due mountains to upbear it then lightly strode child christopher on to the shield and when he stood firm thereon they rose heedfully underneath him till they were standing upright on their feet and the king stood on the shield as if he were grown there and waved his naked sword to the four orts then cried out an old woman in a shrill voice lo how the hills rise up into tall mountains even so shall arise child christopher to the kingship thereat all the folk laughed for joy and cried out child christopher child christopher our king and for that word when he came to the crown indeed and ruled wide lands was he called child christopher and that name clave to him after he was dead and but a name in the tale of his kindred now the king spake and said friends now it is time to get to the board and the feast which hath been stayed this while and i pray you let it be as merry as if there were no striving and unpeaced betwixt us and the winning of peace but to-morrow we will hallow in the moat and my earls and my barons and good men shall give counsel and then shall it be that the hand shall do what the heart biddeth therewith he leapt down from the shield and went about the hall talking to this one and that till the board was full dight then he took his place in the high seat beside jack of the toffs and david and gilbert and his other foster brethren sat on either side of him and their wives with them and men fell to feasting in great glee but one thing there is yet to tell of this feast when men had drunk a cup or two and drunk memories to good men dead and healths to good men living amidst this arose a grey-haired carl from the lower end of the hall and said child christopher thy grace that i may crave a boon of thee on this day of leal service ask then said christopher with a pleasant face king quoth the carl here are we all gathered together and we have before us the most beautifullest woman of the world who sitteth by thy side now to-night we be all dear friends and there is no lack between us yet who can say how often we may meet and things be so i do not say that there shall enmity and dissension arise between us though that may be tied but it is not unlike that another time thou king and thy mate may be prouder than now ye be since now ye are new to it and if that distance grow between us it will avail naught to ask my boon then well well ask it now friend said the king laughing i were fain of ending the day with a gift this is it then king said the carl since we are here set down before the loveliest woman in the world grant us this that all we men-folk may for this once kiss the face of her if she will have it so huge laughter and cheers arose at his word but king christopher arose and said friend thy boon is granted with a good will or how sayest thou goldilind my beloved for all answer she stood up blushing like a rose and held out her two hands to the men in the hall and straightway the old carl rose up and went in haste to the high table before another man might stir 
and took Goldilind by the chin and kissed her well favouredly, and again men laughed joyously. Then came before her Jack of the Toffs and all his sons, one after other, and kissed her face, save only David, who knelt humbly before her, and took her right hand and kissed it, while the tears were in his eyes. Then came many of the men in the hall, and some were bold, but many were shy, and when they came before her, durst kiss neither hand nor face of her, but their hearts were full of her when they went to their places again, and all the assembly was praising her. So wore the time of that first night of the kingship of child Christopher. Chapter 27 Of the Husting of the Tofts When morning was, there were horns sounding from the tower on the toft, and all men hastening in their war-gear to the topmost of the other toft, the bare one, whereon was no building, for thereon was ever the moatstead of these woodmen. But men came not only from the stead and houses of the tofts, but also from the woodland cots and dwellings anigh, of which were no few. And they that came there first found King Christopher sitting on the mound amid the moatstead, and Jack of the tofts and his seven sons sitting by him and all they well weaponed, and with green coats over their hauberks. And they that came last found three hundred of good men and true gathered there, albeit this was but the hustings of the tofts. So when there were no more to come, then was the moat hallowed and the talk began, but short and sharp was their reed, for well did all men wot, who had been in the hall the night before, that there was now no time to lose for though nigh all the men that had been in the hall were well known to each other, yet might there perchance have been some spy unknown, who had edged him in as a guest to one of the good men. Withal, as the saw saith, the word flieth, the white dieth, and it were well if they might gather a little host, ere their foemen might gather a mickle. First therefore arose Jack of the Toffs, and began shortly to put forth the sooth, that there was come the son of King Christopher the Old, and that now he was seeking to his kingdom, not for lust of power and gain, but that he might be the friend of good men and true, and uphold them, and be by them upholden. And saith he, Look ye on the face of this man, and tell me where ye shall find a friend friendlier than he, and more single-hearted. And therewith he laid his hand on Christopher's head, and the young man rose up, blushing like a maid, and thereafter a long time could no lord be heard for the tumult of gladness and the clashing of weapons. But when it was a little hushed, then spake Jack again, Now, need no man say more to man on this matter, for ye call this curly-headed lad the King of Oakenrealm, even as some of ye did last night. Mighty was the shout of yeasay that arose at that word, and when it was stilled, a grey head stood up and said, King Christopher, and thou our leader, whom we shall henceforth call Earl, it is now meet that we shear up the war arrow, and send it forth to whithersoever we deem our friends dwell, and that this be done at once here in this moat, and that the hosting be after three nights' frist in the plain of Hazeldale, which all ye know is twelve miles nigher to Oakenrealm than this. All men ye said this, no one gainsaid it, and straightway was fire kindled, and the bull slain, for the said elder had brought him thither, and the arrow was sheared and scorched and reddened, and the runners were fetched, and the word given them, and they were sped on their errand. Up rose then another, a young man, and spake, Many stout fellows be here, and some wise and well ruled, and many also hot-head and willful. Child Christopher is king now, we all know him that when he cometh into the fray he is like to strike three strokes for two that any other winneth but as to his lore of captainship if he hath any he was born with it as is like enough seeing who is his father therefore we need a captain well proven to bid us how to turn hither and thither and where to gather thickest and where to spread thinnest and when to fall on fiercely and when to give way and let the thicket cover us for wise in war shall our foemen be. Now, therefore, if any one needeth a better captain than our kinfather and warfather, Jack of the Toffs, he must needs go fetch him from otherwhere. How sayest thou, Christopher lad? 
great cheer there was at the word and laughter no little therewith but christopher stood up and took jack by the hand and said now say i that if none else follow this man into battle yet will i and if none else obey him to go backward or forward to the right hand or to the left as he biddeth yet will i thou wilfrid wellhead look to it that thou dost no less but ye folk what will ye herein so they all yea said jack of the toffs for captain and forsooth they might do no less for he was wary and wise and had done many deeds and seen no little of warfare then again arose a man of some forty winters strong built and not ungoodly but not merry of countenance and he spake king and war leader i have a word to say we be wending to battle we carls with spear in fist and sword by side and if we die in the fray of the day's work is it but what do we with our kinswomen as mothers and daughters and wives and she friends and the little ones they have borne us for see ye this warfare we are faring maybe it shall not last long and yet maybe it shall and then may the foemen go about us and fall on this stead if we leave them behind here with none to guard them and if on the other hand we leave them men enough for their warding then we minish our host over much what do we then then spake jack of the toffs this is well thought of by howard of whiteacre and we must look to it and by my rede we shall have our women and little ones with us and why not but we shall then but be moving toffstead as we move and ever to some of us hath it been as a camp rather than an house moreover ye know it that our women be no useless and soft queens who durst not lie under the oak boughs for a night or two or wade a water over their ankles but valiant they be and kind and helpful and many of them are there who can draw a bow with the best and it may be push a spear if need were how say ye lads now this also they yea said gladly for sooth they had scarce been fain of leaving the women behind at least the younger ones even had they been safe at the tofts for there is no time when a man would gladlier have a fair woman in his arms than when battle and life peril are toward thereafter the moat sundered when the captain had bidden his men this and that matter that each should look to and said that he for his part with king christopher and a chosen band would set off for hazeldale on the to-morrow morn whereas some deal of the gathering would of a certainty be come thither by then and that there was enough left of that day to see to matters at the toffs so all men went about their business which was for the most part seeing to the victualling of the host end of part seven